My name is Amos Cochran, and I created the audio piece Color Field Outside In. When I was approached about creating a sound element for the Color Field exhibition at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, I had never made anything of the like. My work had mainly consisted of film scoring and my own experimental music. I was quite intrigued by the opportunity to not only create a different kind of long-form piece, but how the presentation of the piece would be unique from anything I had done before. Knowing very little about color field as a style, I set off reading as much as I could about its history. I quickly ran across Helen Frankenthaler's work, and how until that point in history, color was not the main draw of emotion, but rather a secondary thought that was directly tied to the object or objects in the work that acted as the emotional draw. I really liked the idea of stripping away an initial thought to let a secondary thought act as the emotional guide. This kind of abstraction is something I had been using in my music but had never put into specific terms. So if object is first and color is second, in a correlating sound world, perhaps melody is first and sound texture supporting the melody is second. We strip away object, therefore we strip away melody and we are left with sound texture representing color in the equation. I loved this idea and began to work on soundscapes that focused sound texture at the forefront. Having this concept was a wonderful guide, opening up a completely new sound world that championed experimental sound layering with no expectation of melody. This work led to the five pieces that play together as a long form to make up Color Field Outside In. Welcome, everybody. My name is Maria Gastambide, and I am director and chief curator of public art of the University of Houston System, which has one of the oldest and most significant university public art collections in the United States. I am delighted that you are joining us today for the second installment of Color Talks, a monthly series of conversations where we connect virtually with the artists of Color Field, UH's first curated exhibition of outdoor sculptures. On view through May 20, 2021, Color Field features 13 large scale works by seven contemporary artists whose variety of different approaches address issues related to color. Today, the Arkansas based composer Amos Cochran, the soundscape Color Field Outside In is in the exhibition, joins us in conversation with Courtney Crapple, director of the Moore School of Music and professor of piano and piano pedagogy here at the University of Houston. Before diving in, let us take care of some housekeeping issues. We planned a 40 to 45 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session at the end. Please submit your questions at any time through the Q&A chat box. And Courtney and Amos will try to get through as many as they can. And we've also set aside some time upon the conclusion of the, of the conversation for a quick survey. Welcome again, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Amos and Courtney. Maria, thank you so much for having us. And it's such a privilege to be able to do this. Thank you to Maria Gastambidi and Mike Gidry at uh, UH Public Art for all of the work you do, but also for the invitation to participate here. Uh, Amos, great to have you here. Yeah, absolutely, Courtney, thank you so much. Um, for having me and having this chat. It ought to be a lot of fun. Yeah, when uh, Maria was asking me to do this, I think I was saying yes before she finished the question because I was so excited to get to know you and have this conversation. And uh, I'm the director in the School of Music, so I am footsteps away from your piece. It's right outside our building. And so it's been really, really nice to live with it. And I mean live with it because every day I go to work and yeah. I'm you there. You have lived with it more than me and more than anybody else it's great because it's all the <laughs> it's possible that i've done more with it than anyone you know i'm there daily with it yours 
you know, it's, it's, it's always fun to live with things like that. And that's what public art, you know, it fills that space better than any other, I think. So, you know, I've, it's been fascinating. I can't wait to talk more about this, but you know, like your work has, has changed daily too. You know, if the weather's cold or if it's raining or if there's people around or not, it's always an interesting and different experience. So. Yeah, I think also too, before I, I say too much, I, I definitely, I want to thank uh, Maria and Brooke and Michael. Um, for having me be a part of this and uh, arranging so much and just doing so much for this. It's, um, it's always nice when there's a good team behind something, as you know. Um, we can kind of get stuck sometimes doing so much on our own. And when there's a team to help out, it's just such a better experience. And that also, my, my thank you is extended to Alice and Glenn and all the folks at Crystal Bridges for uh, bringing this to life and helping this happen down here. It's really neat. This is the first piece I've ever had that sort of traveled and been somewhere else. So the whole team that's been behind this, I'm, I'm really grateful for them. Great, great. And I would say also to start off, congratulations to you on the accomplishment, developing the piece, getting it here, and uh, everything you did to make it happen because it's quite an accomplishment. So congrats. Yeah, thank you. It was, um, it's an interesting piece. It's not, I mean, like it, my, my work has evolved a lot over the years um, and it's kind of gotten, this is not something I ever thought that I would be doing when I started um, doing music when I was in sixth grade, this is like, it's, 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 it's grown and evolved in a way that actually I feel like really makes sense. But if you'd have told me five years ago, I would be having this conversation with you, especially over Zoom, that it would not make any sense to me at all. Well, let's dig into that. Let's start there. You know, I was born. Uh, what is your background? Tell us about yourself, your background, and kind of what got you on this path. Sure. So uh, I, I think in like sixth grade or so, um, I wanted to play guitar. Are. And all my friends said, hey, instead of playing guitar, because we're all playing guitar, why don't you play bass uh, so you can be in our band? And I thought, well, that's cool. I could like either just play by myself or with a few people or I could be in everybody's band. So I decided to play bass and I loved it. And that's really that's that's like once I hit sixth grade, that's pretty much all that I did. Um, and that's all I really wanted to do. That was my main focus. I, I really I wanted to be in a band and I wanted to play music. And um, I did that all through high school and then a little bit into college and I was playing in bands and um, some life situations changed for me and I decided that um, I didn't want to be on the road because when you're playing, obviously you're just, you're going to be on the road all the time and you're not going to be able to be home. And um, I wanted to be home and be with my daughter at the time and um, as opposed to just living out of a van. So I thought, well, what could I do though that keeps me uh, creating music, but that I can I can do it from home. So I thought, well, perhaps I could compose music, which I had been writing some of the music that the bands that I was playing, but it was really nothing. Like when I, I, I consider myself a composer, if that's what you want to call me at this point, nothing at all uh, to that sort of extent. Um, so I, I kind of, uh, I looked at the landscape and I thought, well, I can get a little white MacBook and start making stuff in GarageBand. Um, and so I sort of dove into that head first, really not uh, being sure what that even, not even necessarily how to do it, but what that even meant. Um, I've, always, I've always been a big fan of just sort of diving in and seeing what happens. Um, and that led to going over to the university uh, in Fort Smith. I live in Van Buren uh, in Arkansas and uh, Fort Smith's not too far at all. So there was a university and they had a composition teacher. So I just knocked on his door blind and said, hey, uh, let me take lessons. And he said, well, you can't really do that. And I said, well, sure. I mean, of course I can. Like, I'm bringing you music and like, let's talk about how does this work. So I, I ended up getting into like, they enrolled me into theory class just sort of so we could do the, you know, the house cleaning stuff to where we could actually do lessons. And uh, so I worked with a teacher for about a year, just kind of getting a sense of, you know, you, you need to back. I mean, I think it's good to just dive in and it's good to, to, to not know, but it's nice to have a little bit of guidance. Um, and so uh, my teacher at the time, Charles Booker, uh, he was just great. He, he was really, he kind of just let me do whatever I wanted. And I wrote a piece for Wind Symphony and um, we, I, we performed it and I hated it so much. I, I, the entire process um, was so far from removed from being in a band where you play in the garage and you work on songs. This was a, I was all by myself in a room preparing parts and just all of this stuff. We got like one rehearsal and the rehearsal didn't sound good. And then we performed it. And I foolishly tried to perform with them. Like I played glockenspiel. Wow. Um, and it was really, um, it was a really bad, I didn't like it at all. And I thought, okay, this is not what I want to do. This is not when I, this is, if, if, I, if I'm not going to play in bands all the time and I'm going to compose, uh, there's got to be another way to do this. 
Mm. And so at the same time, I had been making a lot of music on my, uh, my little MacBook and um, I had burned it onto a CD and gave it around to some people. And all of a sudden it came up to say, Hey, did you, do you want to write music for a, a move for a film for a movie? And well, I thought, well, that's cool. Well, let's do, let's, let's try that. Um, and then it just, it sort of clicked for me. I mean, there was definitely a learning curve because I, I mean, I think still today, even when I'm scoring films, there's a learning curve, but that made sense. All of a sudden I felt like I was on a team again. I liked, um, I liked working with directors and, um, you know, you, you sort of, you, so then I threw myself into that and then a lot of stuff just worked out. Um, I was, uh, the first film that I scored for some friends in Arkansas won the film festival that year. And then through that, I met people. And as you do in this kind of business, you meet people, you do a thing and you meet five people. And one of those, one of that crew has a film and then you work on that one. And then all of a sudden <clears throat> you meet a lot of people and do things that way. So that's kind of, that evolved for a long time for me, um, doing that kind of work. And then then there was a, pr a pretty big shift about two years ago for me. And I, I really kind of assessed the landscape again. And I, I hadn't really, I had done a lot of composing and a lot of film music, but I hadn't really written a lot of stuff that was mine. Mm -hmm. um, because with film, you're always serving a, large, a vision that's someone else's. Um, you know, somebody, a director's always going to go through and have to sign off on every little thing. Um, so I started to write, so I was starting to write and produce and record and eventually perform music that, that really started to feel like mine. Um, and then that led, in that time when I was really started, that was, I guess, two years ago, maybe a year and a half or so ago. Um, I ran into, uh, I actually met Allison and some people at just an artist hangout and they, I, we didn't even talk about doing anything at that point, but I think it was that night it's one of those things you just hang out and go go hang out with people say yes to stuff <laughs> i was in yes mode and i met i met them and then they said hey do you want to write music or do you want to do a sound piece for this and i think you know we could get into a long conversation about the you know, musical what i was listening to at the time transition but i was really i was ready to do that i think had i been asked to do that to do this piece you know two years prior i wouldn't have understood what it meant i wouldn't have understood what to do um, and so then it's just evolved into this whole thing. So it started out as this little kid that just wanted to play bass and experimental jazz bands, whatever. And, um, then, you know, years down the line, I'm creating this piece and here we are talking about it. So when you, when you lay it out like that, it's really logical, but it never felt, you know, it was, right. never, it was never really logical when it was all happening. I think that's true of a lot of like musicians' stories. You know, you, you, if you start during the present, you can trace it back very, very logically. Like, oh yeah, this led to this, but you never know where you're going to end up once you uh, until you sort of get there, right? So that's really interesting. You know, when I hear like during the introduction, when we're hearing part of Outside In, we're also hearing some of your other works. There's definitely like a cohesion in that style, even though the 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 function is different for those pieces. Uh, is there a way, this is a really hard thing to answer, I think, as sort of an external listener or the composer, but like, do you have a description of what you do as a style or what you like? like yeah, you know, I think, uh, I think I would probably answer the question with, with, a, with an, an interesting look at that. And I don't really think of it, I don't want to say, oh, I write music for piano and strings and electronics, and it's a little experimental. Uh, it's pretty much written down, but it's kind of, you can improvise sometimes. Like, that's a really specific to the point answer. I, I think what I like to create at this point, whether it's something like Color Field Outside In, or it's a film score, or it's a piece of my music that's going to be performed, but I like to create environments for people. Um, and I like to create uh, a place for them to have uh, a bit of an emotional experience. Um, that doesn't dictate too much the direction they should go. Like, I don't give people lyrics. I have this huge philosophy about people like, why don't you use lyrics? And it's like, well, I like to give people this sort of sphere that they can stand in and they can go in any imaginable direction. Whereas if I give people lyrics, two people are going to hear the same lyric and kind of be sent off on the same path. Like, I want to avoid that path completely. And so that's why I think a lot of this music, and especially with Colorful Outside In, it, it creates an environment uh, for you to think in, and then you're left with your own thoughts to journey through it. And that's why I think everybody, it offers everybody a very different experience. Even if we're sitting next to one another listening, we're going to have at the end of it, we're going to have a very different experience. And I think um, when, when I first started to perform, I would talk to people after shows and they would tell me this kind of thing. And I didn't even really think about it like this, as far as um, this kind of emotional 
state that you fall into. It's almost a meditative state that you, you're able to focus and sift through your thoughts. Um, you know, I want it to sort of be a safe place. Um, but a lot of times our thoughts really are pretty spooky and scary. And so, I, you know, I think it's important to uh, just let your mind wander in any possible direction. Um, and I think a lot of what Colorfield, uh, the Colorfield piece does, uh, it, it lays the groundwork for that quite well. Yeah, well, you're talking about like that emotional experience, you know, of what, what the audience has. I'd, I'd back up a step further just to commend you on the fact that your audience has an emotional connection. Like I think in, in your work, I've had that immediately. Like you can't help but feel. And congratulations. I mean, that is an accomplishment as a composer. Um, I don't know, man. I think, um, I think that's actually more about the listener than it is about me. Maybe um, me then. <laughs> I do. I mean, I think it's, um, I think I give you a space and you bring to that space what's going to let you experience it. And it's not like we bring our umbrella and our suitcase to the space. It's usually what we bring to the space on a, a sort of a mental thought process level. Um, but, you know, I don't, um, I mean, I have had this concept in this conversation about somebody when it comes to my music, I want everybody to be crying by the third whole note, but then we're okay by the end of the fourth whole note. Um, so tear them down then build them back up yeah yeah so i mean i do i mean i know that my music gives some um, it, it gives it's a pay it's patience for the most part i mean some of that stuff we listened to at the beginning um is fast paced and is moving but a lot of it is patient and i think um i think we live in this world where we have no time time to get people's attention um and to create anything that sort of demands that you pay attention to it, I think is really important. I, I've been thinking a lot um, about this concept of how we're just very passive listeners. And, and I don't like that. Um, I think we've, uh, we've sort of adapted into these creatures that just, we've, we've, it's hard for us to, to, to find the time to sit and be still and listen. And so I do, I think, um, I, I like that my work offers that to people. And I like that there's a time-based element to all of my work. I think time is really important. And, you know, I don't sit down and say, okay, cool. I'm going to write something that's six minutes. I mean, when I'm writing or creating, I don't worry about that. There's no formula for it, of course. Um, but, and I think a lot of it comes from film scoring because a lot of that is uh, really with film scoring, you're, you're strictly just manipulating a lot of the time with film scoring, you're really manipulating how people are reacting to how someone looks at somebody else or what it's like when a car is following another car. Um, and I did that for so many years mm. and that was just my job. That's what I was doing. I wasn't doing it with a purpose. And so now I've done that for so long that those, those sort of things just, they, they just kind of happen. They're sort of just, they're built into the water at this point. Right, right. Like the, the music, the sound, it has a, a power to bring you into the moment, you know, like you're talking about, you know, everything's so fast paced these days, but like that can be one of the, the really special qualities of this type of art is like to, to bring you into the present. And it sounds like when you say time, so you're thinking about longer periods of time in particular. I'm thinking about time, thinking about time as a medium, like time okay. as a, as like when we look, I've, I've never created anything that's stagnant. Um, I, I think the passage of time in a work is important for me. And I think thinking it's almost like if we use color and light as mediums, um, you know, you don't think of light, you like, you look at a James, you go do it, uh, go to a James Terrell and you don't really think of light as a medium until you do. <laughs> and then you go, oh my gosh, wow, this is light as a medium. With a lot of what I'm creating and I'm curious about, I mean, time I see as being one of the most important mediums. Uh, it's the same as paint. It's the same as a color. Um, and, you know, a lot of this is, a lot of these thoughts are newer to me. And a lot of them I, I sort of came to actually when I made this piece, because this piece really, you know, obviously it's a piece of music and obviously we know who Brian Eno is. And so none of this is revolutionary. Um, it's not breaking any ground, but I think conceptually as an artist, it's, it's fun to find different kinds of outputs for things. Um, and, you know, a piece like Colorfield, it really, the output's totally different. I would never perform this live, really. Um, I mean, I could, but it wouldn't really be the same. And I like thinking of, it's like, how are we, I mean, I, I kind of saw it as, I think uh, my friend Katie wrote a piece about it and she said, like, I think the title of it had something to do with scoring an art exhibit. And so it kind of, it's this sort of falls in the middle between a piece of music uh, and a sound piece, because I think real sound art, I think this is, I feel like this has a little more color than a lot of when I hear sound art. And I, if I, 
looking into sound art. I mean, I like to think of it as that, but I think it leans a little more towards music um, because a lot of stuff that ends up being sound art, you know, for lack of a longer conversation, it, it can be just this very, very long drone that all yeah. it does is evolve a semitone over 30 minutes, which is cool. And I, I like it, but for me, that's not that exciting. Okay. I need yeah. to be more to play with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of sound art might diverge from sort of a tonal center like you've used to, to you know, yeah. further afield from that. Uh, this, ch this comment in the chat, not that we're in the Q&A now, but I'll just bring this up because it's related to the conversation that this person's commenting. Uh, Cynthia says, you know, she likes the idea of creating those experiences without using uh, lyrics. So like, uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that. Like, what would you think, like, what would be the function for or against, you know, the incorporation of lyrics, like dig into that a little bit. Well, I mean, this is something that I have been, I've talked about and have a, have a pretty reasonable thought on, I think for, for me at least, I mean, I think everybody can take stuff and do whatever they want to with it. But, you know, again, it comes down to if, um, if I give you lyrics, if I, if I say words, even though we're all gonna respond to those words differently, it's gonna give us all the same path to stand on and then we take off. I don't want to give anybody even a path. I want sort of just them to be dropped in the middle of the sphere and they're able to go emotionally go any, any direction. And I think lyrics, uh, as powerful as they are, and they're, I mean, I think at the end of the day, lyrics are more powerful than, than sound. Um, but the experiences that I prefer to, uh, to offer to people and to uh, experiment around with, it is, it is more of uh, it's just a sonic sort of dream, dreamscape that allows everybody who's listening to go in different directions. I, I, think, I think lyrics offer a, a grounding point that I would prefer to leave out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe let's dig in a little bit into outside in, like thinking about uh, the development of that. And if anyone here uh, hasn't checked uh, your Facebook page out, I'd encourage you to go to find him on Facebook. And he's talked a bit about process and putting this piece together and some of his other works. So be sure to look him up there and uh, check it out. Um, but tell us, you know, like, how was it put together? Um, how was it developed? Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I did, I mean, I, I, I know again that I, I come from this world of film scoring where every single moment, for the most part, not always, if you're working with a wonderful director that says do whatever you want, but that's very rare. So I come from this world where moment by moment, things are so monitored. And when I started talking to Allison about this piece, I said, well, you know, what do you think? And she, she said, oh, just do whatever you want. And I thought, okay, that's cool. So we went and walked around the woods and we talked and um, I, I didn't really know much about color field. I, I really didn't know where to start with this, but I knew I needed a general concept to springboard. And so um, I mentioned that this is said really well in the introduction video that I made. Um, and I'm gonna not say it as well here, uh, but it's in that intro video. And it has to do with, um, you know, before the Helen Frankenthaler's work and before a lot of this, uh, what is kind of known now as color field, um, color was not the initial, uh, that was not where the initial draw of emotion came from. And so I, I like this idea. It's like, if we're putting color in the, in, the, in the forefront and color is being used to pull out the emotion, like how do we transfer that music in a concept it's like well we've had melody this whole time and then we have these textures behind the melody but the melody is what drives it so if we're ripping away melody and we bring texture to the forefront I, I liked that concept it's like how can we how it, that we we're going to say the texture is more important than the melodic phrase um, and as soon as I thought that I felt wide open to do anything I wanted to and a lot of it had to do with just experimenting I sat down um, and I would pull up a sound and what I would actually do to get sort of nerdy about it is I, was, I would, I would um, automate the equalizer. I would, I would just hold down a chord on whatever sound I liked and I would automate the equalizer. So it sounds like these long things are shifting when really I'm just messing around with the EQ. Um, but I really liked how those textures came about. And so I would just sit down and just improvise. I would just, I would make stuff up and um, I, would, I would always record it and kind of make a final version and throw it in a folder and then you know, it's with anything. I mean, if there's a deadline, deadlines are the best because you've got you've to start making decisions. I think if there were no deadline, I could have worked on this kind of thing forever. Um, but I usually do work under tight deadlines and I like that because I don't get to think too much. So I had sort of, I had compiled a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, and also to Allison and I, we talked a lot um, 
the way that it was played at Crystal Bridges, there were actually two versions. There was inside out and outside in because the way the exhibition worked there, there was work that you looked at inside and then you walked outside and walked through the forest to see a lot of what, uh, a lot of the art that's up in Houston um, was out in the forest. Or you could start in the forest and you could walk through the forest and go inside. So that's where outside in or inside out came from. Okay. My thought was, you know, let's give people, if they listen to the same thing in a different, because uh, again, I guess I am jumping ahead a bit here. So it was, uh, it was sort of puzzle pieced together. I would improvise something for like five or six minutes, put it away, and then improvise something else. And then I would drop all these pieces. I had like five or six, I don't even know how many pieces. Um, and I've just kind of put them together. And I thought, well, what works? What do I like? And so I ended up with like with five pieces that made up the whole. And then we could play those pieces one, two, three, four, five, or five, four, three, two, one, depending on which version of the piece we liked. Um, at this point, the one in Houston is just outside in. So that was the one I liked that opening piece when you're standing out under the trees in the forest is quite fantastic. Um, and I ended just in general, I, th I thought the flow of that one was better. Um, so I had this piece and, and, and again, Allison and I had never talked about time. We'd never talked about how long any, we hadn't talked about anything. And I remember sending her an email when there was like a couple of weeks left. And I said, do you wanna listen to this? And she's like, no, just do whatever you want. And I was like, okay, okay. So again, I'm still coming in this world where I'm usually so heavy, Molly, it's, everything's moderated and everything is sort of signed off on. And I have this like 25 minute piece of music that's going to have a sign with my name on it at Crystal Bridges and nobody's even listened to it <laughs> except me. And I, there was this moment where it was so wonderful and it was such a sort of like as an artist and as a creator, it was really impactful where it's like, okay, I'll just do whatever I want and not apologize for it. Um, and I really think that that moment has really helped me grow as an artist. When someone really trusts you, mm. it's like, you make whatever you want. And I think, I don't even think Alan was Alice and listened to the whole thing until we actually did our talk where it was playing the whole time. And so I just, I love that. So like when someone puts that kind of trust in you to create something, you know, they're not hiring you to, to color something, a color they're telling you. They, they're, they're, they want you to color it, whatever color you want and they trust you. And so I, that was a great, uh, that was a great part of the process for me. I think I learned so much making this piece I have yet to even process all of the things I learned. I mean, historically about art and the way that can play into this stuff, but also too, just in, as process goes along and learning how to trust myself more. So, um, you know, that's kind of the, the piece. I mean, and I didn't even talk about, I ended up recording my string players. I know there's some videos on Facebook. I actually, I recorded them because um, though most of it was made with synthetic textures, I, I really do and sort of back to my, my music as a whole. I love the idea of synthetic textures um, but then to have organic texture mixed in. And so I, I recorded a lot of found sounds out in the woods, uh, in Crystal Bridges at the trees. I walked around the galleries and just recorded the sounds of people walking. And, but you, know, you, don't hear that, you don't hear that exactly in the piece. I manipulated all of them. But again, just using like how many different ways can we take sound as texture and move it around. And like just the, the you know, I could talk about the bow sound on a violin for an hour and how much I love just just the sound of the bow moving, not even a, not even a note, but just the hearing the rosin, like yeah. fall, the bow on the strings. And, you know, those are things that as I sort of grew musically became really attached to, and I was able to magnify them in this piece. It's like, it's really, let's make those again, let's make the texture, the focus, um, much like color field brought color to the forefront and made it the focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's a good example. I actually like the sound of that rosin crossing the strings. That's a very natural, you know, that's a physical texture which you can associate with the nature right there. Um, and I like that. And I, th I think there was a time, I, I guess when I was first doing film scores, I, I used a lot of sample. I mean, I still use a lot of samples. We sort of have to, to some extent. But there was a, a very dear friend of mine and I, we started working together a lot and, and we were really, we really got obsessed with uh, piano sounds. And specifically when you put felt on an upright piano and the really light touch and making those hammers and, and the, the movement of the keys, uh, it really magnifying those within the mix of a piece. And that, that's kind of what I, I, I think that's kind of what really started me off on this path of, because uh, when you're using samples, most of the time they're very pure and they're clean and they sound perfect. Um, mm. And that's nauseating after a while, especially when you've been in a room with real string players and you feel, um, you know, what that, you know, just their bow pressure against, the string, you can't, 
put that on a sample. And so I, I've, I have over time at this point become quite obsessed with those sort of those nuances uh, that make it feel real. That it's, that's the kind of, it's the entrance. I've said all samples are awful. In the middle of the sample sounds great, but the entrance right. and the exit is what is, is wretched. And I mean, no matter what Spitfire's done, they're great. I love Spitfire. I use a lot of their stuff. At the end of the day, the movement between notes, because it's not the movement between notes, it's the pressure on the on the bow between notes that makes it feel real. Sorry, we're kind of off on a violin conversation. No. But, um, <laughs> it's know, fascinating though. But it is like, I love these textures, like the way, um, and also too, I've been doing a lot of more string arranging in the last couple of months. And um, uh, I have a violin player that I work with a lot. Uh, we don't perform anymore, she's moved, but we had a FaceTime just the other day where we went through bow changes and the difference between passages if the bow changes are up or down. And I, it's just, it's fascinating what you can continue to learn and learn. And again, I, none of, I never went to school for any of this. I've made it all up as I've gone along. So yeah, yeah. I have this very hodgepodge way of learning cool. stuff. Well, I think that's a very, very great observation, especially like the attack and the release of these notes and how that affects so much of our impression of it. There's actually good research on that to show that, you know, if someone was trying to identify an instrument type, like, oh, that's a violin, if you take out that attack and release, it gets very difficult for people to even say what instrument they're listening to. And I can imagine. Yeah, the yeah. sound is always, it's always pretty good. And then uh, the... Hey. If you were gonna give uh, just the audience here like a, a quick listener's guide, you've talked about these five distinct sort of sections you put together, right, for outside in. Um, mm -hmm. How would you describe those sections? Like if they went and listened either online or in person, what kind of textures are they gonna experience? Oh gosh, in all honesty, I, don't, I haven't listened to this piece in a while. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll give you a quiz. <laughs> Oh, you should answer this question. Um, but I think, okay, so let's see. Uh, you know, it opens with, it opens with a very, um, it's a very large, again, this is, this was under the trees out in the woods is what I was seeing. And it's this quiet sound. It almost sounds wind-esque um, that ends up just opening up. And there's this one chord change in it that I've always just loved. And this is why I love improvising. Cause I just, you know, I would never play it that way again. Um, but we, I guess the first part of it is this really wide open, you get this, you start out small. And again, you, I like starting out just infinitely quiet to where you, you have to listen from, the, if you have to listen from the very beginning, you're gonna be there the whole time. Um, and like, there's that whole con concept of like Miles Davis, he would just whisper when he talked and everybody would really listen to him. And just that idea of if you're, sometimes you're quiet, you can, you can say a lot more. Um, so the beginning of it does start out quite quiet and opens into this, this much more vast uh, spatial sort of thing. And most all of these, and on most of my work, it has this build that starts out at a quiet, quiet level and builds until you can't build anymore. And then it either falls off or it just disappears back down to where you've almost questioned whether or not you've just listened to all of that. And I think this, so the first part of the piece it does that, and then it goes into much more sort of textury kind of, I, I'm pretty sure it goes into the section that it almost sounds like you're rubbing like little pieces of wood together. Mm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure, I, I always liked that one. Um, and then that's when we first kind of really get some strings. Uh, I think there is, there's strings in the first part too, but um, that's when we really kind of get, that's the first time we're sort of given any sort of melody or any kind of string lift going on. And then I'm pretty sure that the third section is actually a string piece. Um, it's a it's a piece of mine called Sleepy Boy, um, and I remember seeing it as this really great. If there's five pieces and they go in either direction, in the middle of each of them is going to be Sleepy Boy. Um, but Sleepy Boy also has uh, this version of it specifically has very amplified textures. There's a lot. There's a there's this plugin I love. It's called Kinetic Metals. Have you ever heard of Kinetic Metals? No. Um, it comes in all the native instrument bundles and no one has ever talked about it. I can't find a single person that likes this as much as I do, <laughs> but it's just this person has sampled. You just hold down a key and there's just these like rotating metallic sounds. Um, and I've, I use them on too much stuff at this point. Like if I had to do anything, it's like, give me a piano, a violin player and kinetic metals and I will be okay. Um, so the kinetic metals, you know, kind of speak to the texture on that. And I really use a lot of reverb and I really, I really saturate a lot in that. And then the last piece is actually harp. Um, uh, there it's, I recorded my, my friend Devney playing harp. And that was just one of those things If I just, I, when the day that I recorded, there's a video or there's a picture of me standing under the canoes at Crystal Bridges with a recorder. 
And um, that same day, my, my cello player, uh, Christian, he was rehearsing with Devney. And I said, well, can I just come like record you guys and see what happens? And they were, they were rehearsing in a stairwell in the music building, I believe, on U of A campus. And um, I got there before Christian did and Debbie was just playing. So I just, I recorded her just doing all kinds of different, I was like, what's the strangest stuff that you can play on the harp? Like, I want you to just improvise the strangest sounds. Like, I don't need, I don't need you to play anything melodic. I just want to get tone, just textures from you. And so I recorded those for five or six minutes and then I manipulated those. And that's the last piece of it that you hear. Um, okay. So. That's really great. Uh, I think that'll really help people get drawn into it. And I'm going to go play with that sample immediately after this interview. It sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, Heavy Metals is the absolutely, put a little bit of reverb on it, a little bit of EQ. And it, there's just so many things. It's like music. It's like they've sampled music boxes and old rotary phones and like, like silverware clacking together. But it's set up on a sample thing and you can just, it's so fun. I'll show it to you sometime. It's great. Yeah, I think my evening is set after this, Amos. Hey, uh, let's go back. There was a comment you were talking about when you and you were sort of planning this and you and Allison were talking about this. And there was this moment you talked about, you know, this trust that was put in you and you had this moment of like, wow, this is so great. It takes a lot as an artist to embrace the vulnerability of that moment and say, I'm ready to let this go and I'm going to put this out into the world. And uh, like, you know, it's sort of that leap of faith, like I'm going to put myself out there and it's going to happen. Like, what would you say, because I mean, you've done so many great things now and what would you say to people who are just getting into this and starting to experiment? Like what kind of advice would you share as they try to make that leap? Sure. I think you just, you have to say yes. Um, you have to be completely okay giving 100% and something not working out and being completely okay that it didn't work out because it's a learning experience. Every single thing that you're going to do, if anything, if you're trying to get going on something and somebody says, for instance, I'm like, hi, I'd like to, this is a good example. I'd like to score a film. My friend Daniel, I heard my friend Daniel was needing music for a film. I cold called Daniel, I had never talked to him. My friend Matt, Matt said, call Daniel. I called, this is a true story. Um, I called Daniel. I said, hey man, um, I heard you're making a film. I would like, I'm doing film music, which I'd done like one score. I, you know, I'm doing film music now. <laughs> <laughs> can I do your film? And he said, yeah, can you do 40s jazz? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I had no clue how to do <laughs> 40s jazz. I had no idea. I had the Ken Burns set. I knew I could figure it out, but I just lied my face off. And I said, yeah, of course I can do that. You bet. I got off the phone and just, I had no idea what to do, but I knew it needed to sound like the Ken Burns stuff. And yeah. that was the film that we then won the film festival with. Um, wow. So it worked, you know, I figured, and I just dove straight in. So if the opportunity comes up to try something that you want to try, the only responsibility you have is to do it, is to try it. It's okay if it doesn't work. It's okay if it's awful. If you just try it, you're gonna learn from it. And I remember leaving that film going, oh gosh, if I'd only known what I knew now, mm -hmm. which is every single thing that, ha every, every gig I have now, I always wish I knew at the beginning of it what I knew at the end of it. So, you know, any, the advice that I have for anybody trying to do anything new is just to do it and be totally okay with the results mm -hmm. as long as you learn from them. Yeah, yeah. I hope that sort of answers the question. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. How about the, uh, you know, thinking about you take something away from every project. You talked about this a little bit earlier, but, you know, think about outside in and color field. And so what is the, what are those things you wish you would have known at the beginning of this project? Man, um, you know, this might be one of those really special projects where I'm glad I didn't know anything. Really? Yeah, because I, I learned, I think there are these moments when you learn so much and these opportunities come up where you, you, on the back end all I realize is how much I learned. Um, I really don't, I liked this project so much and it was so different and it really it fit into, I mean if I sort of had a plan that I wanted my music and my, my art and my work to evolve into, it fit really well in that. I was, I was ready to do something new um, or at least where the output was new because I'm a firm believer in, in, in different outputs for things. I don't want to just score films. Um, I don't want to just make art installations. I don't want to just release music. I don't want to just perform. Like I want to do all of that. Um, so I, I really, I think, I think Colorfield might be uh, this weird example of something that I, I can't, I can't 
pinpoint a certain thing I wish I had known because had I known that I wouldn't have had the chance to experiment and learn like this was a huge experiment that's all that this turned out to be um, so I have to pass on that question <laughs> for this for this specific piece yeah yeah well let's think a little bit about what's coming next for you I don't know if you have something planned now but like maybe even not just the project but you know as a musician a composer as a human being like what what would you like your next you know like personal growth or next goals to be well in all honesty i would like things to get back to where we can do things <laughs> like <laughs> can that be like can that be okay can that be nice because i i loved what i would like to do is what i had planned to do at the beginning of this year which was to expand regionally i would like to take some of my installation work um i've started i need to send you this piece i made called memory dissolve um but it's a visual, it's, a, it's the first visual piece I've made. It's a piece of music, but then there's this long form visual that goes with it. Um, I would like to do more of that, but I, I would like to take what I have done at this point and just branch it out regionally um, or however far I can get it to, to more people to experience. I want to play live again. You know, I, I really, I want to be in the same room with people and play. So, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think there's a new thing I'm trying to do. I sort of just want to regain and get a better handle on, you know, the things that we were able to do right now. Um, I mean, I have, there's, I, I scored six films in quarantine. So there's a lot of films coming. There's stuff I've, that, that's coming out, um, but I've released a lot of albums. And I'm just, I'm not that interested in putting out more music right now. And so I just, I would like to, you know, the, I hope that the, this next year, I hope that the future holds where we can be in the same room and have a conversation and then play music and then go experience, you know, go stand outside together and listen to Colorfield and talk about it then. So, you know, I, I think the evolution is actually a step back um, and it's not doing things new, but it's, it's kind of a harnessing what we used to be able to do and, and to do it in a way that um, is respectful of the fact that we had to stop doing it. Yeah. 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 Well, there's something quite beautiful actually, like about your wish there, like, such a simple wish if you think about it last year we would not have wished for that thing like just to be together standing outside listening to this or just be in the room making music right you know i just i want to have a gig on the calendar i want to know that because i started this thing uh in quarantine i, I didn't mean to start it but it kind of came up and i kept doing it called piano and coffee um and i would just wait i was usually on a saturday morning and I'd wake up and I'd, you know, I'd promote it. I'd hit a point I promoted them, but I would just get up in my pajamas and put my phone on the piano and I'd play through my song. Nice. And Courtney, I'm so tired of doing that. Like, yeah. I, I'm so tired of playing piano to an, my, my living room. <laughs> and so I think I need, you know, go, going back again to sort of outputs of things. I, I want there to be different outputs. I want to go to film festivals and talk about film scores. I want to go uh, to Houston and do a performance and talk about color field. I want, um, to take my installation work, I was, I had actually, I had gotten accepted into this thing called Art Fields in South Carolina that my installation piece was going to go to. I want to go to South Carolina and I want people to experience that. I want to stand in the back of the room while they watch this thing and I want to see how they respond to it. Because I think, um, I, I really like, I like when things can evolve. And uh, if you don't see how people are reacting to things, it's hard to evolve them. And uh, we can't do that. Like I can see a candle, uh, my my hot chocolate cup, and my television right now. Like we're not really in the space together. I'm not able to see how you are experiencing this conversation. Yeah. And yeah. I am very influenced by that. I, and I don't. I was uh, the other day. I went. Um. My my dear friend Blake. I actually one thing I would. You know, one new thing I would like to do more of. I'm glad that we've gotten around to this. I would like to um, write music for dance. Hmm. I would like to write a piece that I think as far as I, when I look at outputs, we have film and we have installations and we have albums. Uh, I've done a little bit of dance and a little bit of theater, um, but I was able to collaborate um, with my brilliant friend, Blake, uh, who's a dancer. And I loved that experience so much. Um, and I actually, I got a couple of weekends ago, I got to go, he was performing um, at the Momentary Museum. Uh, that's part of the Crystal Bridges in, um, in Bentonville and I got to go in the same room as Blake and watch Blake perform. And I, I didn't like get upset and cry, but I was just so, I didn't realize how starved I was to be influenced by my peers because I think my ideas are good for like seven to 10 minutes. And then I need some, so I, I, 
and they're fine and I will recycle them and I will do them. But watching Blake do what he did, it was just infinitely wonderful. <laughs> and it was like, this is what I miss. This is what I, this is what I don't get when I sit in my living room in my PJs and play another piano and coffee. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I totally identify with that need, you know, even in this conversation, like we can't see the people we're speaking in front of, right? And we can't read that audience. No. <laughs> um, I mean, I like to laugh. I like to do, I like to play really serious music and then laugh about it. <laughs> and, like, and then laugh in between and then play really serious music and then laugh in between. And yeah. that kind of energy, it's really important. And I, I think a lot of times with so many things in life when it's gone is when you realize how important it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. That playing music, you know, in front of an audience where you get that energy back, you send it out there and it comes back and you can react to it. It's almost like we've been uh, working in space or something, you know. And <laughs> really interesting way. To, I don't know what it's like working in space, but it feels like that. Like I did right at the onset of this, I did a, we switched one of the last performances I had booked we uh, decided at the last minute to do a live stream. And it was one of the first live streams that was really good. It was in the studio I recorded in, the cameras were good, the audio was good, the, like people were not tired of live streams yet. Everything about it was promising. And it felt like the most glorified rehearsal that I've ever had. Um, and after the song, we'd let it die down and we'd look around and then I would talk to the camera and it was like, at least you, I can look at you. I right. felt like my words, I felt like everything I was saying fell directly from my mouth into my lap. Right. And right. yeah, I'm just, I, I'm tired of it. Like I, I can't, uh, it, you can't be inspired. I shouldn't say I'm tired of it. Uh, you can't be inspired by that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I, I need to be around my friends and look what yeah. they're doing and be inspired by that. It's like we were capacitors, you know, we had stored all this energy up and we've just run out of it and it needs to be recharged by our audiences, friends and all. We can't recharge it through computers. Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, wonderful as technology is, you know, I, I, we can't recharge that through computers. Yeah, we did an opera out in the Grove next to your piece, by the way. And uh, we actually had a performance <laughs> this past fall. It was one of our first big performances. And, you know, at intermission, people were just in tears. Not only, I would say it was a great performance because our students were amazing, but also people were starved, starved for that experience. So and I think we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> and we'll get you here, by the way, we'll get you when you come to Houston and we visit in person. And uh, we'll also get you into our, uh, our dance program and you can see some of the dancers there, maybe get inspired by them. I'd love to see them. I mean, I think that I, I need... I had hit a point where I was, I sort of feel like I lived in this hole and did film scores for so long. And then when I started to you know, sort of find new avenues for things, that was inspiring new ideas and it was inspiring new ideas. And I was just, I, I, we need that again. We need it again. Yeah. Well, hey, I've had the guilty pleasure of having you to myself here and we should grab some of these questions here in the Q and A. So um, we've got a question from Isaac. He says, hi Amos, I've read that for this piece you sought inspiration from nature and your surroundings. Could you talk a bit more about the importance of the natural environment in your work? I think you talked some about that, but maybe expand. Um, you know, I did. I, I went out and I recorded a bunch of found sound because a lot of the music I've been listening to, I, I, they, you know, how do you, how do you find new sound sources? Um, and I think as sort of to our last conference, quick chat there, uh, when you hold down a synthesizer, there's only so much you can do. And there, it's gonna only do a certain thing. When you go out and record a forest in nature, you're gonna hear so many things that you would never be able to come up with. Um, you know, just the way a bird call interacts with the way the wind blows. Um, and again, you don't hear these things directly in the piece, but they are in the background and they are manipulated and they're reversed and you can texturalize those things. And so they end up creating, you know, nature does an amazing job of creating randomness. And so when you're, when you're working with time and you're working with longer, longer pieces, any kind of random thing that can be thrown in there, it's much like improvising. Mm. Excuse me. Um, when people improvise, you're reacting to that randomness. And so uh, I really did. I liked, I liked doing that for this piece. But, you know, uh, again, just uh, the mix of natural sound with synthetic sound, I, I think is, is one of, it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite things. And a lot of this comes from 
listening to music that was being made in Iceland and the, uh, there's, a, there's this long progression of, uh, of listening to music, but hearing that for the first time and going, whoa, uh, this is cool. These are synthetic sounds. And then someone's playing a trombone and a viola over it. And I've never heard that and I love that. And so it creates this new entity. Um, and then you can get over the fact that someone has a laptop on stage because it's just, it's no different than a, a violin or a piano. Like it's just a way to produce sound. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I think if you take out the violin, the viola, and you just have the synthetic sound, it's kind of meh. If you take out the synthetic sound and just have the violin, the viola, it's great. But when you have them together, you, you create something that's a new and, and that's, that's exciting. Yeah, cool. Uh, here's a question about uh, sort of your process and your experience during that. It says, Amos, does your mind create visual images when you're composing Im Im composing music? Um, you know, I, d I would say a pretty solid no on that. I, I don't know where my mind goes. Um, I, I generally, and I don't hear things before the fact. Like I've tried to explain this before and I don't have a great, I actually don't have a great explanation for this, but when I'm writing something, I don't know where it's going, but I know when it's wrong. And I'll write and I'll mess with notes and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll come up with a piano thing. I'll put that into logic and then I'll be writing a violin part. And the violin part will just be totally improvised, but there's like two notes that follow. I'm like, oh, that works. And then I'll build from there. Um, but no, I don't see shapes a lot of the times. I think the, I'm, I don't have synesthesia. Actually, I have a very, very good friend of mine that has synesthesia. And I've learned a lot from him. He sees stuff in color. So we would do work and I would send it to him and he'd say, yeah, this is nice, but it's a little too pink. I need it to be royal blue. And he'd hang up the phone. <laughs> so um, I'm very aware uh, that it, sound can have that, you know, real impact to people. Um, but, you know, I think there's a whole thing. I mean, when we close our eyes and go down the mind tunnel that happens, right. try to, you know, see the edge and it keeps going. I mean, I, I think I see more of those actually when I'm performing perhaps than what I do when I'm writing. Because I think when we're writing or we're creating, there's a space we're in, but we're always being quickly taken out of that space to, to process and to think. And then we're making it up and we fall back into the space. That's why I'm a big believer in improvising when I'm first writing stuff um, and not worrying too much about specifics. Um, so yeah, that would be my quick answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Great. The other question here is, can you talk more about audience interaction or engagement? I guess we can interpret that in a few different ways, maybe about, you know, when you perform live, what you like to see, but also maybe like how the audience might interact or engage with outside in, I suppose. Sure. Well, I think, um, you know, outside in has been interesting because the, the way it is it in, in Houston now, to some extent, is different. And Crystal Bridges, we actually... I won't get all the way into it, but originally it was just gonna play on like an app. So the idea was that you would walk around, you would move while you were listening. Then we were able to break it up over a set of five or six speakers in the forest. So you'd walk and that's how you would experience it. You would, you wouldn't, you would sort of come upon different parts of the piece and they wouldn't necessarily play start to finish. Um, uh, so I, I don't know how, I didn't, I don't know how people really experience this piece. Um, I, I can talk a little bit to my live performances or the installations that I've made. Um, and a lot of that is th that people do actually find these, these uh, to the last question, people see shapes and they see colors and they see patterns in their mind or in the sky or however they're seeing them. So, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, and I, I like the installation work actually because I'm not doing it in real time and I can't I think the installation the, the visual installation work that I've done That's where I've been able to observe the most and I love <laughs> I love watching people be completely in a trance um, Like when there's the memory dissolved the piece that I mentioned when we first premiered it It premiered in this gallery and we black box the gallery. So in front of you you saw this piece, it played like, I think it was uh, 11 feet by 20 feet or something. It was huge. You were totally immersed in it. And um, people, uh, how do I put this? They, oh, so it played on a loop. So when it got done, it started back over and the whole room didn't know what to do. Like mm -hmm. some people were like, hey, we should leave now. And other people were like, no, no, we can't leave now. It's playing again. So all of a sudden it became this social study of 
when are people comfortable enough to leave, which is different than a live performance, obviously. Um, so I do, I think it's interesting to watch how people can sort of find this sort of mental zoned out state to a lot of what I do. But at the end of the day, you know, that, that's up, that, that's not, I don't, I don't feel, that's not up to me really. It's up to the individual listener, you know, how their response comes out. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to backtrack in our conversation, but I'm still very curious, uh, you know, thinking about your process, but also you were mentioning like, okay, you've got a laptop on stage now, or you were also talking about recording sounds out in nature. Tell us about your gear. Can we dig into like the technical aspect for just a I second? Have, yeah, we can a little bit. I, I, I'm not like a gearhead. I really don't have a lot of stuff until last year. I was working on a 2011 MacBook Pro that managed to still be alive. I miss it so much. It has since it passed away. It was actually the first thing that disappeared during the coronavirus. When the coronavirus came out, my laptop died, right. um, which was, uh, it was right. kind of a bummer. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, so I have an iMac and I use Logic. Um, I have a little four channel interface um, and I use a good amount of Spitfire samples for things. Um, but you know, at this point, I've kind of graduated to where I work a lot and there's a studio that I work a lot in and they have a lot of tools. Um, but as far as found sounds goes, I actually, that, that little recorder that I recorded with is uh, not even mine. I borrowed it from a friend. It's just like a Zoom H4 recorder. Mm, yeah. which I, I don't know why I don't own one of those at this point. I love those things. Um, so, you know, and then when I need to, a piece of paper and a pencil to write some stuff down. But, you know, I'm really not a big, I, I'm more a fan. I have, people will call me like, hey, what do I need to buy? What do I need to get? And I'm like, what do you have? Yeah. Um, do you know how to use what you have really well? Because, you know, a certain thing doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. What matters the most is under, you know, knowing how to use the things that you have. I'm a, I'm a much, I have a buddy who's calling me like, he's like, hey, I want to get this microphone and try this. And I'm like, but just use what you have, like <laughs> just work yeah. with what you have right now. So, you know, as long as you can, as long as you can capture a sound source and you have some tools to manipulate it, it then comes down to you and the way you're hearing that and the way you're reacting to that. Yeah, we're kind of in a sweet spot with technology, you know, where it's developed to a point where just your average tools can yeah. capture some pretty amazing things. Uh, and I have a Zoom that you can even click into your iPhone that records quite well. I was watching, uh, do you know Ryuchi Sakamoto, the composer, sound artist? Yes. He has a great documentary that everybody should go watch called Coda. I don't know if you've seen Coda, I haven't seen it. but there he has out just out in the woods with his phone and this little microphone and he's beaten on trees and like metal pieces. And then he takes it back to his studio and it's just the way he manipulates it more so than how he didn't have a big crew capturing stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. I, uh, you know, I had sent you this clip where I went out with your work and I was playing a, a digital piano out there with it. And uh, when I first set that up, this kind of is talking about the, the, the recording of the sounds in nature there. I was setting it up and I said, well, what am I gonna record this with? And I said, well, I'll just use my phone. And then I was recording, I was like, oh, there's so much noise in the background here. How am I gonna control for all this? And then I realized that's exactly the point, right? Like bring it on. And so, uh, you know, I was there playing and completely immersed in the moment while uh, you know, a chainsaw was going off in the background. That's real, like that's real life. I mean, I think when we can create these experiences that, you know, we are reminded that real life is going on too. And, you know, I mean, I love what you went and did and I love that whole concept. And I hope that when the weather warms up that, you know, that can perhaps at the end of this uh, be more of a thing that yeah. students can go out and do and play on. Because I think, again, I, I like how pieces can evolve. Right now, we're not in a place where I can go see how things are going, but that they're naturally evolving like that, I think is very exciting. Well, I definitely know that's going to happen soon. Uh, I wish it could come sooner, but uh, when we can have you here in Houston, we certainly will, and we'll collaborate more. Uh, in the meantime, though, I think, you know, the color field and your work outside in has really added to the quality of our life in the environment. It's changed our daily experiences. Um, I see a message here from Jeffy Brewer, by the way. He says, thanks, Amos and Courtney. And by the way, Jeffy, thank you. I was there for your talk with Mike a few weeks ago, and that was a great conversation. I was just amazed by your process, too. So Mike, thanks for being here. Can I talk about, I love Jeffy Brewer. He's great. I'll just yeah. say, Jeffy forever. He was one of my favorite things about Colorfield is that I met Jeffy Brewer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really cool stuff. Well, uh, anything else you want to add before we wrap up here? Uh, you know, I don't think so. I, I think you and I can chat down the road uh, for uh, forever about different things. But if there's nothing else you need from me, I don't think I have a lot to add right now. 
I really enjoyed this. It was a real privilege to spend some time with you. Real privilege to have you here as part of the public art. Again, thanks to uh, Maria Gastambidi for everything she's done to make this possible and the whole team. And uh, Amos, we will sign off now. We'll certainly be in touch. Until next time, sir. All right, take care, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Great job.